Hey everybody, how are you doing today? Uh, my name is Patrick and I'm here with Research Hub where uh, the idea is a company uh, that accelerates the pace of scientific research using a Reddit style forum. Uh, we're extremely lucky today to be joined by Dr. Tim Holm. Um, Tim received his PhD in mechanical engineering at Stanford working on material science and the electrochemistry of energy conversion and storage devices. In 2010, Tim co-founded QuantumScape which is a company focused on developing batteries with sufficient performance and price to enable mass market electric vehicles. Uh, Tim currently serves as the CTO for QuantumScape and oversees elements of advanced materials research, uh, tech, uh, technical product development, machine learning, and intellectual property. So Tim, thank you so much for coming. We're really lucky to have you. I'm very excited for this. Well, thanks for inviting me. I, I appreciate it and I'm happy to help research. I'd, I'd like to take off. Awesome, thank you. So just to kind of get started, and I think to give a little bit of background on yourself before we get into the actual paper itself, um, I'd like to know like, when you were in college and starting grad school, like what drew you to studying electrochemistry? And then uh, when you decided to start QuantumScape, kind of what was the motivation there? Sure, okay. Uh, so I studied physics as an undergrad and I was, I was fascinated to get quantitative about things. When I was trying to figure out what to do after that, though, I, uh, although I love the people who study string theory and I wish them the best of luck, I wanted to do something that I thought could have a more practical and applied impact in our lifetime. So I decided to switch to uh, engineering and I specifically chose energy because it felt like a field that was both really important and also afforded some opportunity for quantitative and technical improvements to people's lives. Uh, so I chose energy and went into a PhD working in energy. Um, and then this, the second question around how we started QuantumScape, um, it was a little bit luck more than anything else. I had decided that I wanted to have some kind of a research-based uh, career in quantitative science and engineering. Um, I was working on a few ideas around solar cells in my PhD, fuel cells and, and batteries. Um, I. It just so happened, though, that some venture capitalists contacted me after we won an award with ARPA-E uh, and suggested that we start a company. And it felt like sort of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to really make an impact. And by the end of my PhD and, and postdoc, I was a little bit jaded on the idea that publishing papers would have a big impact. And I, it felt pretty clear that if the that while the, while the company would have a low chance of success, that if we did succeed, it would have a very high impact. So from an expected value point of view, it seemed like a good idea. Yeah, it seems really interesting. Even just looking at this paper, how there's like half of it is kind of the academic theory behind lithium ion batteries. And the other half is like the practical implementation of how do we make these things in a cost effective way that half the world can use them. So it's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. The other thing too, just a little background for everybody. Um, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for 2019 was actually given to, I, I guess, Tim, you probably know way more about this than me, but the inventor of the lithium ion battery. So kind of cool. Yeah, three people shared that Nobel Prize uh, and there are three of the people who contributed some of the most to the development of lithium ion batteries. So John Goodenough, who's still a researcher at UT Austin, Stan Whittingham, who was working at Exxon at the time, and then uh, I think the gentleman who was leading the effort at Sony who commercialized the first lithium ion battery. Very cool. So yeah, if you don't mind uh, sharing your screen, we can jump into the presentation. Okay. And then also if anybody in the audience, if you have any questions at any point, uh, go ahead and type them in the chat and I'll um, jump in and ask them for you. Uh, I'm going to have to, sorry, ask for some help. There's a share button, but it's, uh, that will share to Twitter or something like that. So there should be an icon above your uh, head in the, um, basically next to toggle mic, toggle video. All right. I got it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Any issues. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be talking about a paper from the, uh, Department of Energy. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to set the scene a little bit um, to give everybody a background. My idea is that the audience, um, my target audience doesn't have much of an uh, idea about how batteries work or what their figures of merit are. And so I want to introduce that. 
Um, I, I'm assuming you all are somewhat quantitative or at least can follow quantitative things, uh, but no background in batteries is necessary. So that's what I'll go through first to sort of set the stage before we jump into this paper and then go into Q&A. Um, so first of all, one of the key figures of merit of a battery is its energy density. That is how much energy per mass or energy per volume that it has. And this is a graph showing energy density of lithium ion batteries since they were introduced by Sony in 1991. So when they were introduced, they had uh, about 100 watt hours per kilogram. So that's, uh, again, energy per mass of the battery. And then they've increased at um, roughly 5% per year since then. So it's an improvement of something like Moore's Law divided by eight, roughly. Um, and the difference in that is instead of performance doubling every two years or 18 months, as you might get in Moore's Law, here you get a doubling every 15 years. So it's, it's a big difference. And these improvements haven't been a result of um, real radical chemistry changes. It's been by and large the same chemistry uh, that was introduced in 1991, but there have been small manufacturing tweaks and improvements that have made modest improvements by doing things like taking inactive components of the battery and make them, making them slightly thinner, uh, winding coils tighter, reducing manufacturing tolerances, things like that, that have added a couple percent per year over the last 20 years. And uh, we foresee that those kind of improvements will uh, continue or even slow down. Uh, I don't think that that following this same trajectory will result in a big step change, whereas what we're trying to enable uh, is a much higher energy density in terms of uh, both per mass and per volume. And I think that would break open a, a real market in the mass market electric vehicle. So I'll be talking a little bit about uh, electric vehicle applications and, and really briefly about other applications of batteries. Um, so in, in the grid scale market, um, this is a projection from, from Bloomberg that there's gonna be an increasing penetration of renewables in the electricity market. And once you get a significant penetration of renewables into the electric generation market, you're gonna start needing some battery as a buffer to store the, the energy that's generated when the wind is blowing or when the sun is shining. In fact, here in California, we're already reaching that point. Uh, from what I'm told, new installations of renewables often have to come along with batteries. And when I say have to, that's not by regulation, that's just for the project to pencil out and make economic sense. It should be packaged with batteries. Uh, and then we're all familiar with consumer electronics devices where we carry several batteries around with us in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, this is a quick sort of comparison of the magnitude of, of an electric vehicle market versus a smartphone market. So in smartphone pen global penetration is already very high, but the phone, phone battery is much, much smaller than uh, uh, the battery that you would use in an electric vehicle. So if you uh, just do very rough math and get the round numbers right, the potential market for an electric vehicle battery is half a trillion to a trillion dollars per year. And there, there are just few markets larger than this in the world. Um, one way to explain this is if you look at the top 10 companies in the world by revenue, eight of them are either in automotive, the automotive sector or the energy sector. Um, so it's, it's a, a sector of really global importance and global scale. And that's, that's the kind of uh, impact that um, a mass market electric vehicle would have. Uh, whereas smartphones, you know, everybody would like to have their smartphone last a bit longer. Um, it, it is a, a large market, but relatively much smaller than a battery market. Um, the summer of 2018 was kind of a turning point in electric vehicles where a lot of countries and companies made major plans, long-term plans around electric vehicles. So this is a, sort of an eye chart. I don't expect everybody to read everything on here, but it's just to get you get a sense of the zeitgeist that by this point, most car makers and, and most developed countries said, okay, the electric vehicle isn't just a toy or a fad that's gonna go away. It's a better way to enable transportation and have started making aggressive plans to move towards electrifying uh, either most or all of the fleet. So many of these countries have said that they're gonna ban petrol vehicle or gasoline vehicle sales in the coming decades. So the change is going to occur. 
Um, and then this is another forecast by Bloomberg about EV penetration over the next decades, where it has EV penetration at, at very low single digits today, but over the coming decades rising to significant market penetration. So it's an important and a big market and one that should motivate researchers to go after and, and really solve the problem. Uh, in terms of costs, so um, Tesla is, is a little bit of an outlier selling expensive cars. About 98% of the global market in cars is at a less than $60,000 price point, And more than 90% of the market is at uh, less than a $40,000 price point for a car. So cost is a very significant metric for batteries. And probably the, the most significant metric that holds batteries back from wider adoption in electric vehicles today. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the figures of merit for batteries. We've talked about energy density which to a consumer uh, means the range of a car. The more energy density you, the battery has, the more range you can fit in the existing envelope of the vehicle. Of course, safety is of utmost importance. We've all gotten used to the idea of a car full of gasoline sitting in our garages and, and a gasoline tank right behind the rear passengers as we drive around. Uh, but anytime that you have to transport a car, you're gonna require a lot of energy. Um, and so batteries also pose a safety risk because e even if for no other reason, then they carry around a substantial amount of energy. Uh, cost, as we've discussed, is a key driver of vehicle adoption, electric vehicle adoption. Then there's fast charge. So your, your cell phone, your laptop, and your car, it would be very nice if they were able to charge quickly. Uh, gasoline can deliver incredibly high power densities when you talk about refueling your car in in six minutes, say. Uh, fast charge of a car is a challenge for both the battery as well as the infrastructure that would deliver that electricity in, in such high velocity. It's also probably a little bit of a logistics challenge where probably it's not a consumer handling that large of a charging cable anymore, but maybe something automated. And then of course, lifetime. Um, the, the cell phone should last several years, an electric vehicle will hopefully last uh, 10 years and at least 200,000 miles. You'd like the battery not to be the, the, the part of the car that degrades fastest. So these are the five most important metrics for batteries. Of course, there are others. But one of the key challenges in battery development is that there are a lot of trade-offs between these factors. So to take uh, one trade-off that's relatively simple to explain between range or energy and power, so uh, as we'll uh, discuss when we sort of dissect a battery in a minute, um, the thickness of an electrode is, is a very simple knob that can directly tra trade energy for power. So as you make this part of the battery thicker, the ions have to travel through a longer distance. And so they, they therefore require longer to do that, but you're able to store more of the ions. So, that's a direct trade-off between energy and power. And unfortunately, most of the other key metrics have trade-offs between them, which is why the one, one reason that batteries haven't developed as quickly as one might hope, because it, to improve on only one metric, you have to also uh, make trade-offs on these other metrics and, and hopefully not fall back on these other on the other metrics, which makes for a very difficult set of engineering and uh, design challenges. Tim, just for my own understanding here, um, the units, is that watt hours per kilogram, the WH? Yes, yes that's watt hours. So uh, it's it's a little bit of a, a funny unit, but it would be, uh, you know, a one watt hour battery would mean you could draw one watt for one hour, and that would, that would give you the energy. So it's not talked about in terms of joules, uh, just for an engineering point of view, talking in terms of watt hours makes it a little bit easier to know uh, how long your battery could last and what power draw. Cool, thank you. Yeah, so then cost is usually uh, in terms of dollars per watt hour, and then the, the power would be in watts per liter or watts per kilogram. That would be a power density of the battery. Thanks for the question, keep them coming. So now we're gonna dissect a battery so you get a little bit of a better idea of what's inside this cylinder. So this is what's inside a lithium ion battery. It's not at all what's inside an alkaline, like an A or AA or AAA battery, but inside a lithium ion battery, uh, you'll see some, some version of this. So this is, 
This example shows a wound cylindrical cell like what's inside Tesla's today. Most other automakers have a different form factor, but once you unroll what's inside, you'll see the same thing, which is uh, essentially five sheets, two of those that contain active materials and three of them are inactive, but, but structural. So starting from the top here, this sort of copper colored material is just a copper foil. That's a current collector that delivers the electrons to the battery. The next layer here is a layer that includes graphite. Uh, the graphite is the host for lithium when the battery is in the charged state. So lithium sits up here at the in this uh, second layer at the top when the battery is charged. Graphite uh, is just the host for lithium. So lithium sits in between planes of graphite atoms. Uh, and also between the graphite particles, there's a liquid electrolyte that's responsible for doing the ion conduction of lithium uh, between the active particles. The middle layer of this sandwich here is a porous separator. So this is just a plastic sheet. Think about like a saran wrap uh, that you might have in your kitchen, but it's been stretched to be thin and also to tear, and it's it's made deliberately porous so that this lithium that carries the lithium, the li liquid that carries the lithium ions can go through these pores from the top to the bottom compartment. This next layer down is the cathode, which again includes particles that are an active material of a cathode that is again a host that lithium ion will sit in. It's something that has a very high affinity for lithium. So there's a strong driving force for lithium to sit in this cathode material. And the difference in a the lithium affinity between graphite and the cathode active material is what provides the voltage in the battery. And between these particles are again a liquid electrolyte that's responsible for delivering the lithium ions. And then the lowest layer is a cathode current collector. So this is a, an aluminum foil, very similar, but thinner to the aluminum foils that you might have in your kitchen. And so the top, bottom, and middle layers are all, in a sense, inactive. They're structural components. But the, uh, the anode compartment here that contains graphite and the cathode compartment on the bottom are the active materials in the sense that they store the electrochemically active materials that deliver the energy in the battery. So this is what you'd see in a, a battery. And this uh, next picture that I'll show is actually a cross section of a cell from a Tesla where you can see all of these parts to scale. So uh, what you're seeing here actually is a double-sided coating of a cathode on the cathode foil. And then this again is how all of those batteries stack together in a Tesla. So the, literally the, the bottom floor of the Tesla is, is basically just a as many batteries as they can fit in all crammed together. So this kind of shows that if you could achieve a higher energy density of a battery, you could shrink this footprint, which would do a, several things for you. First of all, it would put all of the batteries inside the crumple zones to give you a safer car. Also, it would enable other vehicles that aren't really built around the battery pack like a Tesla is to be possible. So if you look at basically all other vehicle manufacturers, they want to devote a a much smaller fraction of the car to the battery pack. So energy density would be beneficial. Uh, so one more uh, digression before we get into the meat of this paper that we'll discuss is to go into a little bit more about how, how complicated the battery design challenge is. So we've talked about the five layers uh, roughly in a battery. There's also the integration step where everything has to come together and then get either wound or stacked into a cell. And so each of these layers has a set of technical requirements and a set of manufacturing requirements. And uh, in the time of this talk, I'm not gonna be able to go into every one of these, but suffice it to say that there are a lot of requirements for every material. And we call it an and requirements because if you don't satisfy literally every one of the requirements that's listed on this slide, then you will not make a battery that works in the marketplace. I have to apologize. I, I'm certainly not the first one during the quarantine whose work is getting interrupted by their kids. <laughs> Sorry. I can talk to you. All right. So I'm going to continue. My apologies. Um, no worries at all. All right. Um, so uh, BMW has published a paper where they give a take on advanced battery materials. And this is one figure from their paper that motivates why a lithium anode as opposed to the graphite anode would be an important breakthrough. So 
uh, without going into every line on this chart, uh, I just highlight three of them. This line right here is a line of energy density in terms of watt hours per liter for today's graphite inodes. And looking in, on the x-axis are roughly a dozen next generation high energy cathode materials. And so what you can see is that no matter what cathode material you might pick for your next generation battery, as long as you're using this graphite anode, you're not going to achieve substantial benefits in, in the energy density of, of the batteries that you have today. What you really need to do is adopt a next generation anode. So the two that are most popularly being considered are silicon anodes. And a, a silicon then is the host material for lithium in a silicon uh, lithium ion battery. It is able to store lithium more densely than graphite can. And so that is, in, in short, why you can get improved energy density. BMW highlighted this green range here as what they're targeting for mass market electric vehicles. And as you can see, the only anode that, or the only change in a battery that really gets you into this ballpark is going to a lithium anode, which bumps you onto this red curve here. If you use a lithium metal anode, you can get substantial improvements by entirely eliminating the host material. So you get rid of the carbon, the graphite, you don't replace it with silicon, you store only lithium on the anode of the battery, and you're able to get a substantial improvement in energy density. So the paper we're about to discuss is all about the status and challenges of enabling this lithium metal anode, but I thought that this was a helpful figure here to lay out why, why this is an interesting problem to solve. So now we're gonna dive into the paper. So this is a paper that was uh, published by a few authors at the US Department of Energy out of ARPA-E, which is the sort of high risk, high reward branch of the Department of Energy that was started in the st sort of stimulus of 2008 era. Um, they were uh, supposed to be modeled after DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Ag Agency, to lay out high risk, high reward projects and then fund them in energy. So these authors uh, have uh, uh, coalesced a program where they funded some projects around solid state ion conductors because as we'll discuss, a solid state electrolyte is necessary to enable a lithium metal anode. And they have zoomed in on enabling this lithium metal anode as an important target, just as we've discussed, uh, because if you want to reach higher energy density and lower costs, this is the single biggest change that you can make to today's batteries to get there. Uh, so we'll, we'll jump into this paper. Figure one, they show um, a schematic similar to what I've shown in terms of the uh, size to scale of each of the layers in a battery. So here on the right, they have an aluminum current collector. Then you have the cathode active layer, the porous polymer separator, the graphite layer, and then on the left, uh, the copper current collector. All of these layers are roughly to scale, more or less, for a lithium ion cell. And you can see right here visually that the change as you go from this, the top panel to the lower panel that's enabled by going to lithium metal. So the graphite anode uh, stores lithium as, as a C6 Li. So six carbon atoms for every lithium atom. And that eliminate, if you eliminate all of that graphite and store only the lithium metal, you get this big improvement in the volume volumetric energy density of the battery because this battery on the lower panel stores as much energy as the one in the top panel does, but it's much more compact. And so if you're able to make that change, uh, it would yield a big energy density improvement. It could also yield a big cost improvement for a number of reasons. One is you eliminate this graphite, which is a, not a very expensive material, but it's a it's an engineered graphite. It's not just a graphite that you would have in your pencil or that you might dig out of the ground. Usually this is a synthetic graphite that's been engineered to have the, the properties that are optimal for a battery. So there is some cost there. There's also the, the processing cost of having to create these graphite particles and deposit them on the copper current collector that you would eliminate when you go to a lithium metal anode. So this, this should enable uh, lower cost as well as the higher energy density. So, well, you might say that sounds a little bit obvious. Why hasn't this been done already? Yeah, the benefit of lithium metal has been clear since early lithium batteries, which actually predated lithium ion batteries. 
in at least the 1960s, people like, uh, we mentioned Stan Whittingham, who won the Nobel Prize recently for his role in developing lithium ion batteries. He was one of the researchers at Exxon that was working on early lithium metal batteries uh, as early as at least the 1960s. So it's, it was clear that it was a simpler technology. Uh, however, there are a lot of safety challenges in working with lithium metal. So actually lithium ion was invented as a way around those safety problems. So it was invented in around the 1980s by some of the other folks who won the, the Nobel Prize last year in chemistry to resolve these safety challenges. So in brief, the safety challenges Lithium metal doesn't like to sit as this nice uh, compact layer that's shown on the slide. It rather um, forms in these coral-like or what are called dendritic or mossy depositions. Think, think about a coral reef that is, has grown into this very strange high surface area shape. That's how lithium left to its own devices, as it were, likes to behave. It'll grow in these high surface area structures that uh, a, are not very energy dense, but B, and, and more significantly, they'll actually grow through the holes in this porous polymer separator and grow from the anode to the cathode. And once you have a metal like lithium that bridges between the cathode and the anode, you have an internal short inside the battery. So electrons can then travel through that lithium inside the battery, and it'll travel from the cathode side to the anode side, uh, and this internal short is responsible for most of the safety problems that you'll hear about in batteries. So when the Boeing Dreamliners were grounded a few years ago, um, or when the Samsung Note had to be recalled, that's because they had internal shorts inside the battery that caused safety problems. So lithium will cause a safety problem and grow what's what's commonly referred to as a dendrite uh, if, if you don't take special, special precautions. So today, lithium metal is used only in non-rechargeable batteries, where you're never having to what's called plate this lithium back on the anode side when it would like to grow in this high surface area structure. It's used only in a non-rechargeable primary battery where you strip the lithium from the anode side, remove it from the anode side, deposit it into the cathode. And if you do that only once, then it's safe. And it, it's actually used in a lot of watch batteries that you might buy today. But if you recharge it, that's when the problems start to occur. So the next, uh, I'll, I'll go on, a, before I proceed with the paper, I'll have a little digression here to talk about safety. Here's a case study of a company that was, that's called Molly Energy that in the mid eighties was commercializing cells based around lithium. So in the lab, they created some cells that used molybdenum disulfide as the cathode material and a lithium metal anode. They were rechargeable in their lab for 300 cycles. They hired uh, a person named Jeff Don to become their CTO. Uh, he'll become <laughs> important in a minute. So they, they scaled up and were producing around 400 cells a day. They won a contract with NGK to deliver these cells into cell phones. Uh, they made some press releases and comments saying, unlike previous lithium rechargeable batteries, our cells don't explode. Uh, well, unfortunately, you might be able to guess what's going to come next. Uh, so they, they made a contract and put some batteries in laptops and phones. Unfortunately, there were spontaneous fires resulting uh, from charging these cells. And uh, Jeff Dunn, who is their CTO, his diagnosis was that the use case was a very slow discharge. C by 100 means a 100 hour discharge, but a 10 hour charge. Uh, and that led to a high surface area lithium, this coral or dendritic like lithium that I've described, which would cause a violent reaction with the electrolyte. So their failure rate was only something like 10 ppm. However, it was enough that the company went out of business. Uh, and Jeff Don's takeaway from that is that he said the lesson, he told me the lesson of Molly Energy is that lithium metal is completely out of control. You have no control over what the user is going to do. So unfortunately, the user was using it differently than they had tested in lab. They tested, uh, in retrospect, what was the easiest use case to fulfill, with the least likely for lithium to grow in these high surface area structures. And the use case was the worst use case out in the field. Uh, so that really set back lithium metal cells. Um, and the, the takeaway from that is that failure rate of much, much, much less than parts per million would be required on large format cells. 
I kind of have a question about this. I'm, I'm, I come from a biomedical background and oftentimes in drug design, like you can prove that something will work, uh, you know, in like a test tube or in a cell and then in a patient. But one of the bigger concerns is like, what are the long-term consequences of, you know, using this drug for to treat whatever. When it comes to a battery, how do you in a lab recreate like a, a longer time course in like a short amount of time? Because I, I assume you want a, an electric vehicle to last like 20 years but you don't have exactly. that time to develop the battery. Exactly, yeah, great question. So unfortunately, one of the le lessons of Molly Energy is that they didn't do a good enough job in their accelerated life testing. But what you'll do is develop an accelerated life test and try and probe all of the corners of the use cases and even go beyond. So you'll stress test beyond uh, what, you'll, what you'll allow the battery to do in the field. And you need to develop some sort of a, an algorithm or equation that you can extrapolate back from your accelerated life condition to your to a real world test condition. So the most common parameters to stress the battery in would be in voltage or in temperature. So you can, if you go up to high temperature, all of the reactions will happen faster. Uh, so you can overcharge the battery, over discharge the battery and charge it at very fast rates and do that at high temperatures. Um, to, and then you need to develop that function, as I said, to extrapolate back towards the real world condition. And you need to do that. You, you can also use what's called a drive cycle. So uh, there are real world drive cycles that have been developed by, for example, the EPA and other automakers that reflect real world use conditions for a car. And you'll of course do a lot of testing of your batteries on drive cycles. Um, but you're, you're very right that you can't test, you know, 10 or 20 years worth of conditions in, in the lab. Is there like an equivalent to the FDA to oversee sort of the, the safety parameters of batteries? Yeah, so the UN has safety regulations regarding batteries. Uh, here in the US, there, there are regulations put out by uh, NHTSA, which I think is National Highway uh, Standards or, or Safety and Transportation. Uh, is I think what it is. And then all the car companies will have their own safety tests, in, internal safety tests that they'll do to qualify batteries. So there's there's actually like thick book books of standards for battery, both safety tests and performance tests. Cool, thank you. Yeah, good question. Okay, so um, this was a, a case study showing that High, very high reliability is, is required. Um, we can move on now to figure two in the paper. So figure two was, I think, a, a complicated but very elegant way, once you understand it, to lay out some of the key requirements for lithium metal batteries, as well as the status in meeting those requirements. So uh, we'll spend a little bit of time to explain this pretty busy eye chart here. So the y-axis is the cumulative capacity plated of lithium. So that would be uh, as equivalent to the lifetime of your car. How many miles has your car been driven or been charged for? It would be the capacity, battery capacity, meaning battery charge that is charged every cycle times the number of cycles that the, the car or the battery has been charged up. So y-axis is something like lifetime. The x-axis is basically your recharge power that you are able to achieve. Um, then there, there are two other things overlaid on the chart. One is the size of the circles on this chart. The size of the circle is related to the capacity of the battery. So uh, it's in a per area basis. How many milliamp hours and again, milliamp hours is another way to write joules, uh, uh, sorry, coulombs. Um, but it, it's in terms of how many amps times how many hours could you run that, that many amps through the battery. And it's normalized by the area of the battery because as you scale up the area of the battery, you could store more charge. So normalized per area, a smaller circle is less capacity, less battery capacity, larger circle is more capacity. And as I'll describe uh, later, this is really key to enable a long range electric vehicle. If you're down here at, on these small circles, then the inactive fraction of the battery is gonna be too large and you won't have a high energy density that won't enable a long range for an electric vehicle. Um, what you need to do is get towards these larger circles that is larger capacity of the battery. 
Then the color reflects how much excess lithium there is in the cell. So excess lithium is something we haven't talked about yet. If I go back to this figure, what is shown here is only the amount of lithium that's required to cycle the battery. That is, uh, it's matched to the cathode capacity. Uh, one crutch that, that some people use is they supply excess lithium on the anode side. So if you apply excess lithium, you could basically just imagine this layer growing. At some point, uh, if you're using a lot of excess lithium, then you've completely diluted any benefit of <laughs> removing the graphite and switching to lithium because then you uh, it, call it roughly 200% excess lithium, uh, then the anode is exactly as large as the graphite anode is, and there's then no energy density benefit in switching from graphite to lithium. So it, there's a direct impact on energy density by adding excess lithium. There's also an impact to the cost of the battery because lithium is not a cheap material in, in the metallic state. Um, and then also a safety impact because if you're including a lot of extra metallic lithium inside the battery, that that is an extra energy source that could be released if there's a car crash or, or some, some sort of a safety event. So then uh, this graph shows basically current status of the field on a log log chart so that it spreads everything else out pretty nicely. Uh, the, the authors from the Department of Energy were being a little bit political, I think, by creating this log log chart that spreads everything out and, and makes it easily visible. Um, because essentially uh, this x-axis gets not logarithmically harder or not even linearly harder, but exponentially harder to move towards the right. To, to go from a power of one on this axis, and I'll explain what one means in a sec, what, to go from one to two is not two times as hard. It's sort of e to the two times as hard, roughly. It gets exponentially harder to move to the right side. Um, and putting everything on this logarithmic axis makes it look like, oh, something's not very far away from the goal, when actually it, it might be exponentially far from the goal. Um, so let's, let's talk about what all these points are here. This green point right here is uh, the near-term goal for this program called Ionix that, that RPE launched here. Uh, and then this green circle in the top right is the long-term goal that would enable a faster charge, more like a 30-minute charge of uh, a vehicle. So where this circle lies is um, roughly, um, call it 60,000 mile life of a car that would be able to charge fully in a little under a little more than an hour um, so it's not really a compelling product but it's far enough ahead of the state of the art that they thought it would be a compelling goal and I'll explain in a minute what I mean by saying it's ahead of the state of the art even though there are circles that look like um, they're competitive or even doing better so again you want to be in the top right section of this chart um, so first, uh, these points three, four, five, and six are small little cells that um, were some of the early lithium metal cells that were appropriate to fit a battery on a credit card, sort of a form factor. Um, they, uh, all, as far as I know, all of the companies making these kinds of cells have gone out of business due to a lack of a market. Uh, so those are, are essential so, sort of proof of concept, but not real uh, players here. Seven, eight, and nine were polymer types of cells that use a, a dense and solid polymer as the medium that conducts lithium through the cell. Uh, these were actually driven in cars in France, but uh, of all the companies that I know of that were making these cells, again, all of them have ceased production because of safety issues. So again, not real players here. They also have other significant other limitations that we can get into if you're interested. Uh, then 10, 11, and 12 were cells based around a ceramic or a ceramic plus a liquid as the material that would conduct lithium ions. Uh, but again, fall relatively uh, pretty far short of the goal. And then everything else on the chart, all the red circles, are circles that use a liquid electrolyte similar to what's present in a lithium ion battery today, but they have some 
interface engineering or nanostructure or additives that they've used to try and uh, inhibit the lithium from forming dendrites. But what you'll see is that in all of them, they're very red on this scale, meaning they have a lot of excess lithium applied to the cell. So as we discussed earlier, that essentially disqualifies them from, uh, from being an advance over today's graphite cells because they have such a large excess of lithium in the cell. So to go a little bit deeper. I have uh, two questions on that last figure. Great. If you don't mind. Uh, the first is from Jake who asks, uh, do all four of these parameters have roughly equal weight? Or would you say that some are more important than others? Yeah, uh, good, good question. Um, so it depends a little bit on the application. If we're talking about electric vehicles, I think they're all sort of requirements. I don't think you can relax any of these and have a compelling product. Um, the, I, I suppose the y-axis, which shows vehicle lifetime, is maybe the most important. Uh, the x-axis would be how quickly can you charge the car? And it's gonna be really hard to get electric vehicles out of sort of a niche application if you're not able to do charging in reasonable rates of time. Um, you know, a lot of people don't have a garage that they can charge their car in overnight. So if you're gonna get beyond early adopters to mass market, you're gonna to need to enable fast charge, I think. Uh, and then the, how, you, you need to have this large circle to enable a sufficient range of the car. Um, you could relax from from having zero excess lithium to having to have, you know twenty up to twenty percent excess lithium, but you definitely can't go down here and have a product that has good cost or energy density. Good question. What's the second one? The second question is from John, who asks, "Are all of these results from academics? Who is the furthest along in industry with real batteries?" Yeah, another good question. So not all of these are from academics. Um, for example, these numbers three through six and seven and and uh, two out of the polymer cells were coming from industry. Um, so this this graph was intending to capture a state of the art across industry, national labs, and academic groups. As far as who is furthest along, I uh, don't want to comment on my own company, but I will uh, make a couple comments that a lot of work has been, has been done in Japan from Toyota and others on solid state electrolytes, but they have recently backed away. The Japanese government has made a goal to commercialize a solid state battery as quickly as possible. And the way they've done that is to switch away from using lithium metal to using a graphite cell uh, with solid state ion conductors. So they've backed away. Samsung has published a few papers about their status um, and the, the problems that they're having are in reliability of the cells. So their hero cells, you know, their best 0.1% of cells can do quite well. Um, but as we discussed earlier, you need not just hero cells, but you need to have every cell down to many more than, than uh, uh, your, your failure rate has to be much less than one part per million. And they're sort of on the one minus that side right now. So there's still uh, oh, people trying to do this, but I don't think anybody's especially close. Awesome, thank you. And then thank you guys for your questions too. Yeah, yeah, great questions. Um, so the four key parameters that were on that chart, the first one is the y-axis. It's equivalent to basically a vehicle lifetime range here. So it would be uh, the their fast charge goal point in the top right would be uh, roughly 750,000 mile lifetime for a car. So that's high. I think that one could be relaxed, right? If you have 200,000 mile life of the battery, that's probably sufficient for at least most use cases. Uh, the x-axis is the, the plating current density. Again, that's required for fast charge. This number of 10 milliamps per square centimeter over here, that's their fast charge goal, would enable roughly a 30 minute charge. I think, personally, I think that's not sufficient to get um, real mass market adoption. I think you probably have to get it to the, the more like 15 minute or less 
charge time so that people who are t considering what car I buy has to be able to take me on road trips and take me out skiing and basically cover all my use cases. I think getting the charge time below 15 minutes is, is going to be very important for most consumers. Uh, in terms of per cycle area capacity, this is how large these circles are. Uh, it's how much charge capacity does the battery have. You'll need more than about 4 milliamps per square centimeter to get a 300 mile range car. So that is on the uh, size, sort of large circle size here. And then in terms of fraction of, of lithium that's passed per cycle, if you include excess lithium, uh, that increases the cost of the battery, decreases the energy density, and as I mentioned, will have safety consequences. So here are a couple of quotes from the paper that summarize their take on state-of-the-art efforts. What they say is that no efforts they're aware of have, have met targets on all four of these metrics. And they're saying, we suggest re researchers focus their attention on the complete set of the critical parameters when cycling cells. So typically, uh, what you might see in one of these publications, if, if uh, this research gets published, is that somebody will talk about how they're doing on one of these metrics or one or two of them, but not on all four of them. And so they're neglecting some of the trade-offs that I mentioned earlier that are intrinsic in battery development. They say perhaps the biggest gap in parameters used for lithium metal cycling is the large excess lithium, far more than could be included in a high energy cell, and an amount that makes it difficult to perform careful experiments needed to ensure stable dendrite-free cycling. So they say, in particular, we believe that numerous reports of stable lithium metal cycling in symmetric lithium lithium cells are actually the result of soft shorts. So let me describe uh, or explain what that means. So in some of these uh, data points that are in dark red here, they're using a lot of excess lithium. So to go back to the this battery schematic, there's a big chunk, often many, like hundreds or thousands of percent extra lithium. That what they were saying is that makes it hard to know if the cell is shorted or not because um, one of the feedback tests that you can do to see if the, the battery has developed an internal short and is therefore operating as it should and safely um, is to completely remove all of the lithium so fully discharge the battery take all of the lithium from the anode to the cathode and then you can see a voltage response that is unique that will tell you you're running you've ran out of the lithium on this side if you have so much extra lithium here that you can't run out of it then you'll never see that signal and so actually a lot of of these publications that appear on this chart are as they acknowledge actually not real data but what they're doing is they're cycling a, a shorted cell that is a failed cell uh, without realizing it so one of the big contributions of this paper is that they highlighted that and are encouraging the research community to be aware of it. So what, what they say later in the paper is, we believe that the impressive cycling in these reports may reflect some soft shorting, which means dendrite formation, a possibility that is generally not evaluated by the current lithium metal research community. So they're basically calling out uh, some folks who are not aware that the performance that they were claiming was actually <laughs> far from being a, a record result and demonstrating safety or efficacy of, of their battery, were actually showing that their cells were had, had already failed. So it's, um, it's something that I know to be the case. I, I personally know that there are published reports out there that claim that they have excellent performance from their battery when what they're measuring is a failed battery. Uh, so when I, come back and, and summarize the contributions of this paper. One of the main contributions here is, is calling that out and, and bringing awareness to it. So there are a couple important parameters that were not reflected on their figure. What they mentioned, the two that they mentioned in the paper are the sep separator thickness. So if you go back to the, the schematic again, if the that separator sitting in between lithium is, is much thicker than today's separators, then again, you dilute the benefits that you would get from uh, eliminating graphite. And then also the volume that's required to accommodate cell breathing. So by cell breathing, what is meant is that this lithium layer expands and contracts as the battery cycles. And you might need a spring or something else inside the battery to accommodate that, what's called breathing. And that that's another important parameter on these charts. So there's also a number of other factors. 
Like how large is the cell? At what temperature can it operate? Do you have to apply any pressure to the battery? What what's the reliability or how many failures do you have? And then this cool what's this term is coulombic efficiency, which means what is the charge efficiency of the cell? If you charge up a certain number of coulombs, when you discharge the, the cell, can you get that number of coulombs out? So those are also important parameters uh, to be aware of. So just, just to wrap up on the paper, they then talk a little bit about cost. So figure three and the last figure in the paper on the left is the materials cost. Uh, where they say that the approximate goal for any separator plus lithium metal that you'd have in the cell is about $5 per square meter. <clears throat> Actually, it'd have to be less than that. So today's separators are less than $1 per square meter. So you probably need to be in that range to, to really be competitive. And they're showing that, that some materials have that cost. Other materials would be too expensive. So some of the specialty materials like CAD TEL that's in solar cells might be too expensive or yttria stabilized zirconia, another ion conductor is, is right on their ballpark, but I would assert too expensive. Whereas polymers or, or cheap materials like metal sheets uh, could be cheap enough. <clears throat> then the right chart is not just the materials cost, but the, the product cost of actual products that are sold today in the form factor of thin sheets. And just to, to sort of anchor us on, is this $5 per square meter realistic? So what you can see is that for rolled metal sheets like copper or aluminum, uh, that they can hit those cost targets. For paper and polymers, you can hit those cost targets. But for some of the other uh, more specialty advanced materials, it's hard to hit the cost targets. So what they're saying is that you need to be able to design an advanced material at, and deliver it at scale and low cost uh, to be effective. Um, so I want to wrap up here and before before taking questions, just say, what is the impact of this paper? Why is it worth reading and talking about? It's been one of the more impactful papers in the field, partly because it came from the Department of Energy and laid out some targets and metrics, and also because it sort of called out how other people tend to cheat on those metrics. So I've, I've gotten a couple of screenshots from two other papers just to illustrate the point that this framework is getting adopted by other researchers who are publishing. So the paper on the left here was one that came out a little while after uh, the paper we've been talking about. And right here in the graphical abstract, this one figure is basically they, they took the two axes right off of this chart. The y-axis is cumulative lithium plated and the x-axis is current density. And they're showing where they sit on at least those two metrics. And then the, the paper on the right took basically the exact same chart and just laid down their stars, points 36 and 37, for where they sit on this uh, chart. So what my claim is that is I, from talking to re from reading papers, also from having been at conferences where people talk about it and having spoken with people who work in this field, people do come back to this paper as sort of a touchstone. So it has had a pretty broad impact. On, on how people assess their performance and how people report their performance. So with that, I'm happy to take any other questions that might have come up.